Good evening everyone, I'm Liz Jolly, Chief Librarian of the British Library and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Library to this evening's event, Writers in Conversation. Shortly you'll be hearing from tonight's event chair, the journalist Yvette Huddleston and the authors Tracy Chevalier, Nikita Lalwani and Stephanie Scott. They'll be reading from their latest works, discussing their books and their own experiences and how they chime with the themes and figures featured in the major British Library exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights. From bodily autonomy and the right to education to self-expression and protest, Unfinished Business explores how feminist activism in the UK has its roots in the complex history of women's rights. Unfinished Business is a landmark programme for the British Library, including an exhibition at our St Pancras site in London, a digital programme of events and podcasts, a new book, a new learning website and pop-up displays in public libraries across the UK. As someone with a lifelong interest in women's history, I'm really excited about this exhibition. Writers in Conversation is part of a wider series of unfinished business online events in November that have been developed in partnership with Leeds Libraries. Leeds Libraries has long been a partner with the British Library through initiatives including the Living Knowledge Network and Business and IP Centre National Network and we're delighted to be working with them on this programme. We had originally intended tonight's event to take place in person at Leeds Central Library We've had to adapt our plans due to COVID-19, but we're pleased that we can still welcome these authors and you in the audience this evening, both in Leeds and around the world. Our unfinished business events in Leeds are part of the British Library's growing culture and learning programme in West Yorkshire. The Leeds region is the location of one of the British Library's two sites, which has operated at Boston Spa near Weatherby for more than 50 years and which is now home to around 70% of the national collection. We're now also growing our public engagement in this area as part of a wider programme of increased investment locally. We're pleased that this event can contribute to Leeds' rich cultural scene during these challenging times. I hope you enjoy the event and I look forward to hearing from the speakers. I'll now hand you over to Andrea Ellison, Chief Librarian of Leeds Libraries. So thank you very much, Liz. And I'd just like to begin by echoing Liz's words of welcome and say how delighted we are that you're all able to join us for this evening's event. So I've been in Leeds Libraries now for just over three years. And one of the things I love about my job is the opportunity we have in Leeds to work in partnership with the British Library. And we work with the British Library on a number of collaborations and the Living Knowledge Network, as Liz just mentioned, is one of those partnerships. The Living Knowledge Network really helps us to explore, develop and promote our collections. And we're especially pleased to be working on this latest collaboration on finished business. Leeds has a strong history of women's activism and we have in the city today a real commitment to ensuring that young girls and women achieve their potential. Now, inevitably, um, our plans for our programme of events has had to change somewhat over the past few months, but we have now curated a virtual exhibition, which really features stories of inspirational women, particularly women from the city, as well as showcasing items from our collections that connect to the wider history of women's rights. And then we were thinking about uh, speakers and authors to invite to be part of our programme. And I immediately thought of Tracy Chevalier. I had recently been to the Edinburgh Book Festival and I had been lucky enough to see Tracy talking about her novel, A Single Thread. And it was when I was there at that event that I learned that actually the archive which Tracy had used to research her novel was in fact based at the University of Leeds. And so it was this local connection, as well as the uh, detail in which uh, Tracy ex explores women's experiences in her novels, that we felt made her an ideal choice of speaker. And 
we're delighted that the British Library has been able to facilitate this for us. But tonight, not only are we joined by Tracy Chevalier, we're also joined by Nikita Lawani and Stephanie Scott, um, who will be talking and reading from their novels before joining a panel um, discussing how the themes in their novels connect with the wider themes of unfinished business. So I'd just like to say thank you once again for joining us this evening. I very much hope you enjoy the event and I'm now going to hand over to our chair for the evening, Yvette Huddleston. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here and to welcome you to this event. Um, I'm going to introduce our fantastic panel to start with. So uh, first of all, we have Tracy Chevalier, who was born in Washington, D.C. and has been based in London since 1984. Um, Tracy is a historical novelist, the author of 10 novels. Um, her first, The Virgin Blue, was published in 1997. And her breakthrough second novel, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, was published in 1999 and became an international bestseller. It sold over 5 million copies worldwide, and it was made into an Oscar and BAFTA nominated film in 2003, starring Scarlett Johansson and Colin Firth. Tracy's other novels include At the Edge of the Orchard, Remarkable Creatures and The Last Runaway, and her most recent, A Single Thread, which we'll be talking about this evening, was published last year. Nikita Dalwani was born in Rajasthan and raised in Cardiff. Her debut novel, Gifted, about a young girl maths prodigy, was published in 2007. It was longlisted for the Booker Prize, shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award, and won the Desmond Elliott Prize for Fiction. Her second novel, The Village, set in an open prison in rural India, came out in 2012 and won a Jerwood Fiction Uncovered Award. Her third novel, You People, set in contemporary London, was published in April this year, and it's already been optioned for television, I think, um, by World Productions, the creators of Line of Duty and The Bodyguard. So watch this space on that. Um, Stephanie Scott is a Singaporean British writer who was born and raised in Southeast Asia. What's Left of Me is Yours, published earlier this year, is her debut novel. It's won the Jerwood Arbon Prize for Prose Fiction and the A.M. Heath Prize and was runner-up in the Bridport, Bridport Prize Peggy Chapman Andrews Award. What's Left of Me Is Yours has been listed by The Observer as one of its top 10 literary debuts for 2020. And I would agree with that. So we will be hearing from each of the authors who will be reading from and talking about their books. And we'll also be discussing some of the wider themes of unfinished business, the fight for women's rights. There will be time <clears throat> for questions from you, the audience, and you can submit your questions in the question box below um, at any time during the course of the event. Um, and we will put selected questions to the panel towards the end. Also, just to mention that you can use the menu above to visit the library's bookshop, um, give us any feedback that you may have, and also to make a donation. Right, so if we could start with you, Tracy. Um, a Single Thread, um, fantastic novel. Um, it, it's set in 1932 um, and it kind of, it explores one of the many kind of sad um, consequences of the losses of the First World War. Um, and um, it deals with, um, I'll use this phrase, the surplus women, which is a pretty yeah. un <laughs> unflattering, <clears throat> excuse me, unflattering phrase, but could you just explain to us, first of all, what, what that means? Sure. Um, it, was a, it was a label that Kay was brought, um, came up through the press, uh, newspapers. In 1921, a census was taken in Britain, and it was discovered that there were almost two million more women than men um, as a result primarily of the losses during World War I. And the, the newspapers jumped all over this and said, oh, this is a disaster. It's gonna be a social problem. These women are a problem. Um, and they're surplus, surplus to requirement. Um, 
Uh, so a lot of women who might have expected to marry um, weren't going to. And what were they going to do? This was a society that was set up um, for women, expecting that women would marry and have families. So there was very little access to higher education, very little access to careers other than teaching, nursing, um, and being a clerk. And these didn't pay very well. So uh, the women were, the surplus women were reliant on their families um, to support them. And also they tended to live at home. They often were expected to look after the parents as they grew older. And it was a pretty grim existence for uh, unmarried women at that time. Um, and when I read about this, I really wanted to create a character, a heroine, who was a surplus woman who actually managed to create a, an independent and happy life for herself. Right. So we have this fantastic essential character who's called Violet Speedwell, which is a brilliant name. Um, she is in her late 30s, isn't she? When we meet yeah. her, she's 38. She's still grieving the loss of both her fiancé and one of her brothers during the First World War. Um, and she's been living with her, her parents in Southampton. As you say, she'd be expected to, to kind of stay there with, with her parents. Um, but after her father dies, she, she finds it very difficult to continue living with her very overbearing mother. So she she makes this she she makes quite a brave for decision. It. Yeah. Yeah. Um at the time time of going to go and live in, in Winchester. Um and that yeah. and that was quite a courageous and fairly controversial thing to do, isn't wouldn't it have been? Yes, yes. Um she was expected to look after her mother and she didn't. And the the book uh explores in a way that that tension between uh, duty and freedom. Uh, and uh, But no, she, she goes to Winchester and she ends up uh, a, joining a, an embroidery group who are making cushions and kneelers for, the, um, for Winchester Cathedral. I've always wanted to write a cathedral novel and I was drawn to these cushions and kneelers that are still in existence there because when you walk into a cathedral like that, you, um, you everything you see, uh, especially in an old uh, cathedral, everything you see has been made by men. The stained glass, the, the sculptures, the, the carvings, the tiles on the floor. The only thing we know in that cathedral was made by women, women was the cushions and kneelers. And I think I was just naturally drawn to that, to that. And I decided to write about that group which made them in the 1930s. Yeah. So yeah, they so they were known as the broderers of Winchester Cathedral. And can, can you tell us a bit more about them? Because there, there is a um, one of the um, people mentioned in the novel is actually a real life figure, isn't it? Um, yeah, Louisa I, Paisel. Yes, yeah. Louisa Paisel, and it was Louisa Paisel's um, uh, uh, work, her archive that has been has made its way to the textile department at the University of Leeds. So I spent a very happy day pawing through all these boxes of, of new uh, uh, notebooks and papers and lots and lots of embroidery. She was an embroidery expert at the turn of the century. She worked for the v &A. She taught embroidery abroad in Greece and she traveled a lot. And she, um, she ended up, but she grew up in Bradford. So she always had a Northern connection. And then she ended up in Winchester and organized this group of 180 women to make these incredibly beautiful and unusual cushions and kneelers for the, the choir stalls in the cathedral. And um, so yes, there's a whole boxes and boxes of stuff that I went through um, at the, the library in Leeds. Right. You also, um, I mean, the, the descriptions of the Winchester Cathedral, which you alluded to just a, a little earlier, I felt um, reading those passages are really transported to, to the place. I mean, did you spend quite a lot of time in the, in the cathedral? cathedral? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot. Um, looking at the cushions, walking around, talking to people. And also the, the book is kind of balanced out between embroidery, which was very much a, a women's thing. It was only women who did it. And, um, and this other group that's connected to the cathedral, uh, Bell Ringers. 
So, and that was all male in the 1930s. And they kind of, uh, I, I wanted to contrast the, the idea of women who were making cushions to bring comfort to, uh, to worshipers. So they're bringing comfort to other people, whereas the bell ringers were ringing for themselves. Um, when you talk to bell ringers, a bell ringing is all about, it's not about making a melody, it's about a mathematical pattern. It's very difficult to do. And, um, and the, the, it was a challenge to the men. And they often, um, you'd ask, uh, when, I, when I was doing research, I'd ask them, well, what, what do you think it sounds like to people out, out in Winchester are hearing this? And they're like, oh, I don't know. We're just trying to get the pattern right. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, Violet Speedwell, when she, she encounters both groups, and it's almost like she needs to recalibrate herself a bit to take on not just this notion of bringing comfort to other people, but also doing things for herself for the pleasure uh, that it brings her, uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. to other people. So there was a, it was important for me to get both of those things in. Right. Um, uh, so Violet finds herself um, a pretty decent job, doesn't she, as, as a kind of a typist in an insurance office in, in Winchester. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, the pay barely allows her to sort of cover her rent at the, at the boarding house where she's yeah. living with similar other similar surplus women. Um, and she has to make decisions like, you know, will I have or some dinner to, to the cinema or, or yeah. go to the cinema? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and that, I think, was also a, a fairly common position for those women to be to be in, wasn't it? At yes, the time? I, I read in my research is a wonderful book by Virginia Nicholson called Singled Out, which is about single women in the 20s and 30s. And she quotes lots of um, and she quotes a lot of uh, manuals for these single women, like be a single woman and love it kind of thing. And they were um, I, I had a I sat in the British Library reading through quite a few of these and I found them such depressing reading because actually underneath it all, I was trying to be very, very cheerful about the idea of being a single woman with not very much money and the things that you should have in your cupboard and how you can save money on um, washing by hand washing and various things. And it was actually incredibly depressing because underneath it all was this undertow of really, you want to find yourself a man, if you can, mm -hmm. any man will do and, uh, and get married, because that's actually going to make you a lot happier than washing your um, stockings in the sink. So it was, it was very, um, it, it was kind of undermining itself the whole time. But I used a lot of that information to, to create Violet's daily life, which did involve eating fish paste and, and uh, boiled eggs and sometimes not eating in order to go to the cinema. Yeah, exactly. So that, um, I think this kind of fairly neatly um, kind of leads us into the, the reading that you've um, yeah. selected or the passage that you've selected because it is very much about money. Um, and Violet um, approaches her boss with a request because she is struggling. Yeah. Um, so Yes, so um, I'm, the scene I'm reading uh, Violet's going to see her boss. There were three typists, one left because when you um, get married, you left. And it wasn't the law, but at that time women did, uh, if they married, they were just expected that they would leave their job. And so there's a vacancy and Violet has an idea. So she goes to her boss, Mr. Uh, Mr. Here we go, we're getting there, Mr. Waterman. Violet fortified herself with a tea biscuit, then went to speak to Mr. Waterman. When she knocked on his open door, he was gazing out of the window at the rain. Hello, Miss Speedwell. I was just admiring the rain. The garden needs it. Now, what can I do for you? Is that a cup of tea you've brought me? Just the ticket, thank you. I have a suggestion to make about the vacancy for a typist, Violet said. You do? Mr. Waterman made no attempt to hide his astonishment. Astonishment tinged with disapproval. She would have to hurry to lay out her plan before his annoyance at this female temerity shut down the conversation. I was going to suggest that Miss Webster and I handle some of the extra work between ourselves 
If I take a shorter lunch break of just half an hour and work an extra hour on the weekdays, that's seven and a half hours a week more. You would do that? You would really work more hours for Southern County's insurance? Mr. Waterman's gratitude alarmed her. Clearly, he had misunderstood a crucial element. Of course, I would be glad for the rise in pay, she rejoined. Very glad. It is not easy for a single girl to live on my current salary. The rise in pay? Mr. Waterman wiped his forehead with a handkerchief. Violet could have said, of course, foolish man. Why would I do more work for no pay? Do you know what I eat for lunch? That I never have a hot meal? That my clothes hang off me because I've lost weight and I can't afford to buy new? That I either eat or go to the cinema? That I have no pension and no husband to keep me and my savings are being decimated? That I often wonder what will happen when I'm too old to work? She said none of those things to Mr. Waterman. It will save Southern County's money in the long run, she explained, not having to pay a third typist full salary. Yes, I suppose that's true, Mr. Waterman conceded after a moment. The tide of his disapproval was slowly diminishing. It rose again when she suggested her and Maureen's salaries increase by four shillings a week each and remained high as she patiently took him through the numbers and explained her calculations. You've clearly given this some thought, Miss Speedwell, he muttered, obviously displeased with the idea. But when Violet reminded him several times that there would be a saving of a salary, he reluctantly agreed to set forth this solution to his seniors in Southampton. But, Miss Speedwell, I shall say this idea came from me, if you don't mind. I can't think what management would say to a girl having such a progressive idea. Violet did not expect a response for some time, reasoning it would take Mr. Waterman a week or two to come round to the idea and, in a sense, make it his own. She didn't mind if he did so, as long as she got a pay rise. So she was surprised when two days later he appeared in their office while she and Maureen were typing and announced that Southampton had agreed they could take on the extra work as a trial run for a month. With an additional four shillings a week, Violet felt she had to ask. Yes, yes, Miss Speedwell, with the additional four shillings. Mr. Waterman looked weary, as if imagining he might have to feel this sort of demand from his wife or daughter. After he left, they continued to type in silence. But when Violet glanced over, Maureen was smiling. That's great. Fantastic uh, negotiating skills there, I think. <laughs> she um, so, um, yeah, Tracy, you've said um, that you write about ordinary women from the past who perform small acts of rebellion that build into revolutions, which, and, the, and you can see that sort of beautifully played out in this novel. Um, you can see how violence confidence kind of grows throughout the novel and um, some of her small acts of rebellion I th th this you know trying to find have a romantic life for those women was very difficult wasn't it yeah. so um, can you tell us a little bit about this sort of slightly transgressive relationship that kind of builds up between um, between Violet and one of the bell ringers who you mentioned earlier um, called yes. Arthur. Yeah. Arthur Knight is one of the bell ringers and she gets to know him very slowly. They become friends. and uh, But there's a, an undertow of a current of, of attraction between them, but he's married. And so it's it's always a, um, a supportive relationship. And he's he's very much the moral compass of the book, he and Louisa Pesel. And Arthur has an understanding. I mean, one of the difficulties of writing a novel that's set between the wars is that I know and you readers know that World War II is coming, but they don't know. They don't call it World War I because they don't know there's going to be a second one. They just called it the Great War. Uh, they couldn't imagine there was going to be another war after all that they had been through. 
And for me, it was really difficult to put on the brakes and not give them too much foreknowledge of what was uh, what was going to happen. On the other hand, the book takes place uh, in the early 30s. In 1933, Hitler comes to power. He becomes chancellor of Germany. And that's right smack in the middle of the book. And I thought, I can't let this go unnoticed. And there's another reason why it can't go unnoticed, which I don't want to go into because it's a spoiler, but there's something on those cushions and kneelers that's really surprising, which I discovered when I was in Leeds going through the archive of Louisa Pezel's stuff. Um, she used to make models of what the women would embroider. So she'd make a model and then give it to them and they, they'd copy it. And I one of these um, one of these models, I practically shrieked when I saw it, and that changed the nature of some of the book. And um, it meant that I, I wanted there to be one character who actually had some sense of what was going on, who had the uneasiness about what was happening on the continent and in Germany, and that's Arthur. So apart from being Violet's support, he also opens her up to the wider world and thinking about how, her place in the world and what's going on in the world and how it affects her. So he has a very important place in the book. I think that Yvette has frozen. So I, I maybe not. Are you there, Yvette? I'm, I'm back now. I just, back now. Sorry, I, I did drop out. So I, I caught um, the end of, of what you were saying there, that yeah. the, of Arthur being a very important um, yeah. character in the book. Um, yeah. Partly from him, you know, that he he could um, see what was coming in a way, in yeah. a sense, and what was happening in in Europe. So, um, yeah, okay. yeah, and I think I think in a way he's important because he teaches Violet to be not to be more like a man. That's really a, a crude way of putting it, but but to think for herself, to not be um, not to be oppressed by the 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 position that she's meant to, the things that she's meant to do, the kind of life she's meant to have. So just one small example, when she meets him at a pub at one point and um, she looks around and all the women are drinking. She doesn't want to drink sherry there. It doesn't seem quite right. That's what she's used to drinking. The other women are drinking other, you know, lemon and different types of drinks, but Arthur offers to get her a, a, a half of a veil of uh, the local ale and and that she's the only woman in the pub who's drinking that but it doesn't occur to him he he feels like why shouldn't a woman drink a, a pint even a pint if she wants to so it's um he's much more open-minded and open to the world and to what she can be in it and it it helps her to become more independent yeah okay and uh, there's just one there's a key sequence which kind of um uh, ties in with um again the, the themes um the the wider themes that we might be discussing later but also mm -hmm. into um uh, events in the books of stephanie and nikita as well which is um the vulnerability of a woman on her own um yeah yeah, yeah. so i know what you're referring she, to you know violet yeah. tries to yeah so yeah. she tries to do things so she, she goes out walking in the countryside um which should be a pleasurable experience but if you just talk us through what yeah. happens to her yes yeah, she goes on holiday on her own on a walking holiday there's a wonderful path between uh, winchester cathedral and salisbury cathedral and she walks along it it's called the clarendon way you can do it it's 26 miles and um, she's a little nervous about going on her own and then she starts to enjoy it and then unfortunately meets uh, a man on his own in, in a field and that um, is not great. And she, um, it, it, it's interesting because when I was researching that, I walked, I decided to walk it myself. Actually, my husband and I were gonna go for a weekend and then one or the other of us got ill so we had to cancel it. And the following weekend I could go, but he couldn't and I thought, well, I'll go on my own. And I kept putting off making the reservation for the bed and breakfast because I just I just thought I don't really I don't really feel safe. You know, almost uh, 80 years later, 80 years after what happened, what I create happening to Violet, um, I felt myself that um, we have changed so much in in from 1932 to now. There are many more opportunities for women. There's higher education. There are all sorts of careers are open to us. We're not expected to marry, but 
we still don't feel safe walking through a field on our own. And th that really surprised me when it came home to me that I didn't want to do it myself. So I waited until we both could and I went with him. Um, and, and I've talked to women since who have said, yes, it's very hard to walk alone in the countryside. Good. Well, um, thanks, Tracy. I, um, I think we'll move on now to, to Nikita, but thank you. Um, and I hope that's given everybody a flavor of this wonderful novel, which I, I would highly recommend. I recommend all these novels. I think they're all brilliant. So, um, so if we can move on to uh, Nikita, um, so you people, um, it's a it's a kind of modern day morality tale set in contemporary London. I think it's two thousand early two thousand, so two thousand three, in a seemingly ordinary Italian restaurant called the Pizzeria Vesuvio, which is actually quite extraordinary. I mean, it's a melting pot of lots of different people of different nationalities and backgrounds. Um, so can you tell, tell us a little bit more about the, you know, the background to the novel and what inspired you to write it the, behind the story and why that setting? Well, um, I used to uh, frequent a place that's a bit like Vesuvio in the book. And um, I think that sort of being in that place made me think about lots of questions or I guess moral kind of um, points that didn't have a direct answer, that didn't have a simple answer. And that usually for me is the beginning of thinking about how to write a book in order to try and answer something that doesn't present itself immediately. Um, so, I mean, in the novel, the Suvio is divided by front of house and what's happening in the back in the kitchen. So in the front of house, you've got um, European waitresses who are um, se seemingly Spanish, Welsh, Indian mix. Um, there's someone from Georgia in a restaurant down the road. Um, and then in the back of the restaurant, you've got the Sri Lankan cooks, many of whom are um, officially not, they don't have legal status. And this boundary between legal and illegal is sort of, there in the front and back of Vesuvio and wafting around and going blurring the boundaries and going from front to back is the proprietor um, Tuli who's a character who's sort of playing god with um, all of the people who come to the restaurant for help so it's known as a place that you can go for help you can go there for legal aid you can go there for money um, you can go there if you need help with housing um, food loneliness um, or just for conversation but all of those um, different requests for help take place upstairs which is a sort of no-go area um, and so some of this was happening at the restaurant that I used to visit but as with all fiction it's grown to accommodate the more exciting um, thrillerish elements in this case that um, sort of a plot like that lends you know the, 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 the situation like that lends um lends to you but um the character that um who was investigating or trying to understand the place is called Nia and yes. she um come from Wales and is of mixed race and she's sort of fascinated with Tuli the proprietor doesn't know if it's a romantic fascination or if she actually wants to be him and her fascination mm -hmm. with him and what he's doing and how he's making moral choices all the time is what propels you through the book. Okay, I think you, you've chosen um, a, a really lovely um, scene from quite near the beginning of the novel, which kind of gives us a, a, a lovely picture of what the restaurant is like. It feels like it's a really interesting place. So perhaps if you could read that for us, that would be that would be great. Yeah, great. So this is from the point of view of Nia. The, the chapters actually alternate between the point of view of Nia and of Sean, who is um, one of the Sri Lankan cooks who's fleeing um, the Sri Lankan civil war in the back. This is from her point of view. She stared at everything and everyone in the beginning, ignoring the veneer of detachment that protected other commuters in the mornings. It was the summer of 2003 when Nia joined the restaurant and that particular part of Southwest London was just beginning to gear up for gentrification. You could see the bankers, 
male and female alike, dipping their toes in, walking past the burger joints and chicken shops with appraising gazes, bodies taut with the effort of remaining open-minded, tentatively making it down to the imposing residential squares they had heard about and staring up at the red brick and stucco mansion blocks and sliding timber sash windows. They would go up to the hushed communal gardens that lay at the centre of these squares and lean on the railings, not worried by the locked gates that always caught her out. Instead, they seemed to be practising for a lifestyle that appeared to be entirely up to them. She saw them on their way, on her way to and from the restaurant and marvelled at this idea radiating out from them that the responsibility of shaping a life was all down to the choices you might make. They seemed full to bursting with choices. She had loved the place instantly. In fact, she loved the whole process, walking from the tube, turning down a small road, past the greasy spoon, the betting place, the Australian pub on the corner, till she was right there, standing at the panelled glass doors and looking up at Pizzeria Vesuvio, each word hammered in gold and angled to form two sharp mountain slopes. They were warm days at the start of that summer and these huge Baroque capitals would be flashing with reflected sunlight against a vermilion background whilst underneath you had all the offerings in a humble white font. Cafe, restaurant, pizza, pasta, Vesuvio, your home from home. Inside the space was laid out pretty traditionally, 20 small square tables on the ground floor with the till, counter and wine racks at the back near the kitchen, diaphanous white tablecloths, small accordions of folded paper printed with photos of diners and the splashy headline, Welcome to the Magic of Vesuvio. One candle per table, along with single stems in water, a pink rose or carnation usually, a spiral staircase at the front led up to a function room, with the bar at one end and leather sofas at the other. This was the area where Tuli entertained guests, unless it was hired out for a private party, but also where the staff mostly had their meals between shifts. Some of the Sri Lankan cooks lived above this first floor in a flat that Nia had heard about, and she'd witnessed them disappearing at the end of the night through another door near the bar. She'd watched them go through a dark portal into relative privacy, one or two guys at a time, catch a glimpse of an impossibly steep flight of stairs, register the knitted warmth of their murmurs after the door was locked from the inside and they were no longer visible. There was something fascinating about the definitive way in which they sealed themselves off. They were different from her in that they had a clear end to the day, some place that they wanted to go when work was done, even if it was just upstairs. In contrast, she always lingered when her hours were through unsure as to what she should do next. That's great, thank you. Thanks, Nikita. So, uh, as you... Sorry, can Men's you... Two people. Um, I think it, 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 um, it cut out there, sorry. Well, who's a, a Tamil refugee who's fled the civil war in Sri Lanka by paying traffickers to get him out of the country and leaving his young his wife and his young son behind. So uh, where did those two characters come from and why did you choose to tell the story from their points of view? Well that's a really interesting question. When it started I um, immediately began to investigate the mystery of Tuli and there, therefore destroyed the mystery of Tuli by going into his head. And I uh, deflated the, all of the tension that you need for a book to work and all of the desire to write it actually was kind of deflated in that instant. And I suddenly realized that I shouldn't go into Tuli's point of view. Um, so in a sense, the two characters um, grew out of a desire for Tuli to remain a mystery and for us to see him in two different ways. So when we see him from the viewpoint of a 19 year old mixed race um, wet waitress who looks white and um, looks Italian and therefore gets the job working in an Italian restaurant, but he's actually Indian um, to some degree and wants to understand the place. Um, and then you see him from another person's point of view, um, Sean, the Sri Lankan cook who um, 
has, 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 as you mentioned, fled torture and fled an incredibly traumatic background and has witnessed things that torment him and who is trying to find his family. Um, there are two different forms of need going on in the book, and that's quite an exciting pull in terms of reading. Um, but also the Thule that you encounter in alternate chapters is slightly different depending on who's watching him and talking to him. Um, he's different things to different people. And that is quite an interesting dynamic, I think, in the book. So that's why I did it that way. Um, but uh, the two characters, they grew up in because they, they have different stages of need and there was this idea that one would get sucked into the other person's story um, and then come back out again with character A getting sucked back into, into character B's story to start with and then character B going and getting sucked back into character A's story. And this idea for me came from the fact that in London or in a city like London, we, we all rub up against each other and you encounter people from so many different backgrounds. Um, and then if you're in the same geographical space, um, the, the restaurant operates in this sort of square mile. Everyone, everyone in that square mile around the restaurant um, can come there. Um, then you meet people who are from completely different backgrounds um, than you might otherwise. And so I think that's why those two characters grew, but it was Sean who came to me first. Um, because I was interested in that period when there was an influx of people from Sri Lanka into the UK right. um, in the early in the early noughts. And, um, and what kind of research did you do around that? Um, because you know the whole that sort of very um, insecure life that those people are leading and everything. Um, you know, sort of living in the it, so kind of on the margins of society really aren't they that you know the um there's i mean there's a fantastic set piece which is like from a a crime um thriller or something you know when the immigration enforcement officers raid the restaurant um did you uh, speak to people who'd experienced that um or, or yeah just tell us a little bit more about that yeah for sure um well before i was a novelist i I did work as a documentary maker for a while and I still think that I'm using those same skills um, when I write now. So I usually start with interviews. Um, I talk to people who had experienced that um, very thing, hostile environment, restaurant raids that were taking place regularly during that time and, and that still take place obviously now. Um, and um, I also talked to asylum lawyers, I talked to Freedom From Torture, the organisation, um, but there's a very complicated thing with interviewing people who've experienced torture and that the, act, the actual interviewing of them um, with, with, with PTSD can bring the memories back. So mm -hmm. it was a, I didn't do that, but um, I talked to people about the refugee experience for sure. Um, and also my father was a refugee through the partition of India and that's very much a narrative that's in our family and that sort of turns up again and the idea of survival of family separation there was a lot of that in the partition of india and obviously it's a very current thing right now um family separation at borders whether breaking the law is something that one should do in order to reunite families who've been separated um that's a big question i guess that preoccupied me when i was writing the book and fiction allows you to explore alternate answers for that which you know which aren't legal unlike life I guess yes I mean that's what is really good on those gray areas you know which I you know it's very very thought-provoking because there are these huge moral choices that people have to make um, and, and kind of what um, Shan and Nia have in common is, is that they suffer for us from a sort of survivor's guilt, I guess, because they've yeah, chosen right. to save themselves, haven't they? Um, yeah, yeah they, they both have a survivor's guilt and also they discover what they have in common or that they've both, they both have a survivor's guilt, but they're also both sort of struggling um, in the vast kind of um, loneliness of London to just make it from day to day and week to week. And they're both hoping nothing will go drastically wrong because when you're living on the edge like that, um, if there's illness or if you get thrown out of your flat and bailiffs turn up as happens with Sean 
or if you run out of money and can't buy your um, travel card, uh, you can't get to work. Um, being destitute is sort of very close and very present. Mm -hmm. And the restaurant provides them with a family um, of sorts whilst they are estranged from their um, other, the, the, you know, the families that, we, you know, the more traditional ideas of the more, more traditional forms of family, um, mm -hmm. filial and romantic and their children. Um, so that's a definitely a connecting force between them. There are all kinds, I also wanted that gray area, there are all kinds of Ill illegal things happening in the restaurant, you know, there's benefit fraud, cigarettes are being sold illegally. Um, there are, uh, it's a place that you can go to apply for asylum and there can be a discussion about what will be the most successful way to apply for asylum. Um, and the main character says, you know, it's about the greater good, you know, a few lies here and there are okay. Mm. It's the greater choice and the greater good um, is being adhered to. Um, and at the end, when things become quite dramatic, in the book um, and it sort of tumbles into a, a different world really or a different realm of danger. Mm -hmm. um, Tuli says well would, is it better not to try you know you're going to make some mistakes if you try to help and not just be a bystander not just walk on by when somebody's in trouble mm -hmm. but does that mean you shouldn't try does that mean that you shouldn't force yourself to think about people's circumstances and whether they need help. That person mm -hmm. on the street that needs help, that person who's been separated from their family and needs help getting them over. Um, so the, that's deliberately muddy, I think. I like the reader to be engaged in the process of trying to work out what they think. And, yeah. you know, in an ideal world, different readers who discuss it would have different opinions. There's not a sort of didactic element yeah. to the book, yeah. I hope. No, not at all. It's it's extremely thought provoking and it has like those different layers. But and it's also, you know, while it, it doesn't pull any punches and, you know, it's very it deals with very difficult issues. In the end, I found it uplifting in, in the sense that it shows you how to be kind, you know, which I think is a really important message, especially at the moment. Well, that's great. So, so thank you, Nikita. Um, if we can now move on to Stephanie. Hello, Stephanie. <laughs> Thanks for waiting. So um, I... your book, um, you say in your acknowledgements that the novel was inspired by um, a real life trial in Japan in 2010, in which a woman was murdered by a so-called, now I'm not going to be able to say this, you, you, you'll probably have to correct me, but it's a Wakarasaseya. Very which, close. Really Waka. close. Okay. Um, <laughs> who's, that's a person who's hired by a husband or wife to seduce their spouse in order to gain the advantage in divorce proceedings. So can you tell us a, a little bit more about um, that, that case and why and how it inspired you to write your novel? Sure. Well, the novel is uh, a work of fiction, so it's loosely inspired by that case. But what occurred, um, there was a murder that occurred in 2010, and there the a husband hired a Wakare Sase agent to seduce his wife and provide him with grounds for divorce. Only the agent fell in love with his target, and the target fell in love with him in turn, and she was later murdered. Um, and so the novel really revolves around all of the different kinds of, of love that exist, what love means to each, each of us individually, but also what we are capable of doing to each other for love. Um, how we love, is it possible to love someone and kill them? And that, that's really where the novel began. And, um, and my story begins with Sumiko, a young woman, a, a newly qualified lawyer, um, who grows up never truly knowing how her mother died until one day that changes and so she is drawn into the past narrative this love triangle and she goes in search of the truth of what really happened to her mother right yeah so um i think as you say you mentioned sorry i, I lost you for a little bit there but um she uh, she she was has been told by her grandfather that her mother died in a car crash so that's the story that she's been told um, and then um, 
something well perhaps if you could do the, the reading um that you you've chosen because that kind of sets things up about you know what where Sumiko is and where she's going with what she's found out yep no you're right uh she grows up never knowing how her mother truly died and one day that changes um and she goes in search of the truth so what i know i was raised by my grandfather yoshi sarashima I lived with him in a white house in Meguro, Tokyo. In the evenings he would read to me, he told me every story but my own. My grandfather was a lawyer. He was careful in his speech. Even when we were alone together in his study and I would sit on his lap, even then he had a precision with words. I have kept faith with that precision to this day. Grandpa read everything to me. Mishima, Sartre, Dumas, Tolstoy, Basho, tales of his youth duck hunting in Shimoda, and one book, The Trial, that became my favorite. It begins like this. Someone must have been telling lies about Joseph K. When we read that line for the first time, Grandpa explained that the story was a translation. I was 12 years old, stretching out my fingers for a world beyond my own, and I reached out then to the yellowed page, stroking the written characters that spoke of something new. I read the opening aloud, summoning the figure of Joseph, a lonely man, a man people would tell lies about. As I grew older, I began to argue with Grandpa about the trial. He told me other people fought over it too, over the translation of one word in particular, volumdat, to tell a lie. In some versions of the story, this word is translated as slander. Slander speaks of courts and accusations of public reckoning it has none of the childhood resonance of telling lies. And yet, when I read this story for the first time, it was the translator's use of telling lies that fascinated me. Lies, when they are first told, have a shadow quality to them, a gossamer texture that can wrap around a life. They have that feather-light essence of childhood, and my childhood was built on lies. The summer before my mother died, we were... Okay. Oops, sorry, carry on. I can stop. Um, no, 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 please carry on, sorry. Um, the summer before my mother died, we went to the sea. When I look back on that time, those months hold a sense of finality for me, not because that was the last holiday my mother and I would take together, but because it is the site of my last true memory. Every year, as the August heat engulfed Tokyo, my family piled their suitcases onto a local train and headed for the coast. We went to Shimoda. Father remained in the city to work, but Grandpa came with us. Each time, he would stop at the same kiosk in the sta station to buy frozen clementines for the train. And in the metallic heat of the carriage, Mama and I would wait impatiently for the fruit to soften so we could get at the pockets of sorbet within. Finally, when our chins were sticky with juice, Mama would turn to me in our little row of two and ask what I would like to do by the sea, just her and I alone. Forest sweeps over the hills above our house. I was not allowed up there alone as a child. And so when I looked at my mother on the train that summer, she knew immediately what I would ask for. In the afternoons, Mama and I climbed high on the wooded slopes above our home, Washikura. We watched the tea fields as they darkened before autumn. We lay back on the rocky black soil and breathed in the sharp resin of the pines. Some days we heard the call of a sea eagle as it circled overhead. Grandpa knew the forest, but he never found us there. At four o'clock each afternoon, he would venture to the base of the hillside and call to us through the trees. I often heard him before Mama did, but I always waited for her signal to be quiet. On our last afternoon in the forest, I lay still, feeling the soft and steady puff of my mother's breath against my face. Her breathing quieted and slowed. I opened my eyes and stared at her, at the dark lashes against her cheeks. I took in her pallor, her stillness. I heard my grandfather begin to call, his voice thin and distant. I snuggled closer, kissing, kissing her face, pushing through the coldness with my breath. Suddenly she smiled, her eyes still closed, and pressed a finger to her lips. We no longer own our home, Washikura, on the outskirts of Shimoda. Grandpa sold it many years ago. But when I go there today, climbing up through the undergrowth, I can feel my mother there beneath the trees. When I lie down on the ground, 
the pine needle sharp under my cheek, I imagine that the chill of the breeze is the stroke of her finger. Thank you. So, um, in a similar way to, to Nikita's novel, your um, uh, stories, you, you have two perspectives. So we, we hear from Sumiko um, and her voyage of discovery. And then we also have um, Rina, who is her, her mother and, and Catano's story, um, who, is the, uh, who was hired by um, Rina's husband uh, to, to seduce her. Um, truth and lies are very much at the, at the heart of the novel, aren't they? And there's a great quote which comes up uh, time and again, which is, you know, that the, the lies, of the lies that we're told, the very best ones are close to the truth. But um, that leads to, um, well, a tragedy, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, can you, first of all, I mean, you, you spent quite a lot of time, I think, in Japan researching the, the novel. So, um, and in particular, the Japanese legal system, because there's some very particular things about, certainly around divorce, that, that are um, quite different to, to what we might expect. So can you tell us a bit about that research and what you discovered? Sure. Um, well, this novel has been 10 years in the making, <laughs> so um, I began it in 2010 and I travelled extensively in Japan and I worked with a number of lawyers in Tokyo who were very generous um, with their time and their expertise and really enabled me to do the kind of deep dive into the legal system that I that I wanted to do. Um, of course, even though the novel is told through the prism of Japanese history and culture, it it's, it's exploration of love, relationships, divorce, and the position of women has a, a much more global resonance um, that I hope every reader can, can relate to. Um, and so what, what really um, interested me, I think, is that uh, the number of the lawyers that I worked with, um, they were all women, um, and they'd gone to the University of Tokyo, which is extremely hard to get into, um, and they were very much the minority. Um, and I think the renowned women's studies professor Chizuko Ueno calls um, Japan's gender problem a, a, a human disaster. Mm -hmm. And um, and she sort of speaks about how few women there are uh, at Tadai, um, particularly studying the law. And so I wanted to explore through um, Rina and Sumiko how women can be constrained uh, by society, how, um, you know, we can be trapped by society's expectations and that tension between societal expectations and personal desire. Um, and so even though uh, Rina, the mother, um, starts out um, at Todai studying law, she gets sucked back into her domestic roles, you know, that she's, um, she returns to the home, she's expected to marry well, she does. Um, and so I really wanted to explore the parallel of, of her life and how um, how she is constrained with society and then how Sumiko 20 years later also deals with that and um, and how feminism is progressing in Japan today. Right. Um, I mean, the, the, there's a lot at stake, isn't there, in the divorce proceedings in, because the, the kind of joint custody of children is illegal, I think. Is that still the case? Yeah. It, it, it is, yes, um, although uh, they are currently um, undertaking a study to investigate whether joint custody might be possible. Um, but currently, uh, only one parent is awarded sole custody of any children. And this, um, this of course, leads to um, many heartbreaking uh, situations. Um, and it, it's very, it's difficult as well, because there are arguments for and against joint custody, um, particularly, I think, from women's rights activists, uh, they worry that, um, you know, women will be unable to get away from abusive husbands, um, and they're unable to look after their children and, and be safe um, if joint custody were to be introduced. So, um, there are really a lot of arguments on both sides, right. for and against. 
Well, the, the novel, it's a brilliant combination of um, a crime thriller um, elements of it, and then this very tender love story as well. So th that's a very fine balance that you've got there. Was that quite challenging to write? <laughs> Um, yes, it was. I mean, I, I do love uh, love stories and I'm very interested in um, romance narratives, how they unfold on the page, the expectations that are set up implicitly within them. So I think that was my literary passion really at the heart of it. Um, and then the, the crime element, uh, I really wanted to use that to create momentum, to drive the narrative and, and also to propel the reader forward. Um, I think it was very important to me with the, the crime story um, to really focus on the victim of the murder. Um, I was, I'm very interested in um, violence against women and the proliferation of murders um, against women that seem to only be increasing in today's world. And what interested me was how so often the victim is forgotten and, and utterly defined, they become defined by their death and their, their lives um, are reduced down to that one event. And so what I wanted to do was really go back into Rena's life and Simiko does this in, in her search for her mother um, and really look at her as a, as a person and recover her history. And, and give her the opportunity to um, to live her own story, to write, to write her own story. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for that, uh, Stephanie. I think if we can, if I can bring you all together, the three of you now, and just to have a, a little bit of a more uh, general discussion and hopefully we might get some questions also from the audience. Um, but I, I thought to start with, um, just a question for you, all your, your books um, feature strong female lead characters. So I'm well, um, Violet, uh, Nia and Rina and Sumiko actually. Um, would it be fair to say that they're all trying to take charge of their own destiny, but they're in some way thwarted or hampered by society's expectations of them as, as women. Tracy, perhaps we could come back to you first with that. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think in a way that's where the drama lies for me. Uh, it, 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 there's, if a woman already, if I'm writing about a woman and she already has her her place, she has power, then um, there's nothing to write about. And particularly because I write about in historical settings, uh, the, the women in the past and now one could still argue, but I, I think we've come a long way, but women in the past had very little socioeconomic uh, power and or political power. And if I'm going to write about a woman in the past, she's often the powerless one. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the story is often about how she, uh, there's a problem somewhere that she has to solve. It's about herself or her place in the world. And she has to, she has to resolve it in a way by somehow sneakily gaining some sort of uh, purchase, some sort of power uh, for herself, a, a new place for herself. And, and that is always, um, for me, that's the dramatic story that I'm, I find myself telling over and over again, and particularly for women in the past who haven't been written about. So the book I'm probably best known for is about a very famous painting, A uh, Girl in the Pearl Earring. And um, there's been loads written about Vermeer, the painter, but nothing about the women in his paintings. We don't know who they are. And, and I wanted to change that by, by turning, the, turning the camera around or turning it and putting it on the shoulder of someone else rather than uh, the painter. And, um, and that's, uh, that felt important to me that, that women's voices would be opened up in that way.
Nikita? Yeah, um, I think that uh, for me, Mia, um, she, she's a woman in, yeah, working a... in a restaurant in mm -hmm. which there are a lot of men and she's fascinated with a man and thinks she can be that man. And to some extent, she thinks she's sort of beyond sexual boundaries. And then a moment happens in the restaurant of extreme vulnerability um, about halfway into the book where she is, is reminded of the fact that the same rules don't apply to the men in the restaurant as they as, as do to her. Um, the women in the restaurant are expected to flirt. It's an unspoken idea in the restaurant that part of the job description requires an element of flirtation. And that flirtation leads to a very dark, compromised moment for her when she leaves the restaurant and there is no one to look after her. So that illusion of being in a family and being cared for and being looked after by in the confines of the restaurant disappears once she goes down the dark alleyway around the restaurant. Um, so that in, in terms of agency, you know, in terms of what a character can and can't do, as Tracy was saying, both in their lives and as a character in a book, that idea of um, being female and those boundaries, um, that was interesting to me, I think, in the book. Mm -hmm. But she's very much a go-getting um, sort of character. And she's, I think, you know, if you were to ask Nia what she thinks about her life and she's staring at people who are making choices that's her desire her desire is to create her own fate and as she puts it to spread sunlight rather than darkness in the world and that's a very active desire i guess that she has i think stephanie maybe hi yeah, stephanie i think you better i think that's frozen <laughs> Um, well, yes, as I was saying, uh, the novel um, really revolves around the tension between societal expectations and personal desire and the roles that women are expected to fill, um, particularly in Japan, where they are, um, where it's even now, it, it's still believed that the woman's role is primarily in the home um, and that her focus should be on marriage and children. And I'm very interested in, I suppose, disruptive female narratives where women step beyond their roles. Um, during my BA at York, I specialized in ancient Greek drama and uh, Euripides as a lecturer was, was my favorite text studied there. And that play is all about agency. It's all about Electra stepping out of her domestic roles, out of the, the person she's supposed to be and you know trying to find her own form of, of vengeance. Um, and similarly, I think there are some amazing women writing about uh, womanhood and again, breaking down these traditional roles today. So Sayaka Murata, Mieko Kawakami, Natsuo Kirino, these are my idols really. And I'm very much writing into that tradition of, of questioning, you know, what women can do, what, you know, can they do what they want to do? Um, and, should they and how does that affect society if they do i mean obviously men are very constrained uh can be very constrained socially as well but it, it is the women who fascinate me and uh and so both rena and simico have their own struggles their own personal desires and their own quests for agency i think um um just more generally just thinking about that you know obviously violence against women is very you know it's a huge major theme in, in your book but it, it comes up or potential violence that comes up in in all three books do you how far do you think we've we've come because that seems to be one of the areas that where there hasn't been a huge great deal of improvement in uh, in terms of where we are today would you agree yes i would say you know how far have we come not far enough so it's I, very current i think it depends on the country and part of the world um it's i wouldn't say it's equal across the world um and first i think what has maybe changed in some parts of the world is that women feel more able to speak out that's certainly what the me too movement brought about that there's a there's a willingness to 
go public. Um, and I, I don't know if that happened because of social media, maybe because things can be so much more public um, than they used to be. But uh, but that uh, but but that doesn't go across the board. There are other countries. It sounds like Japan probably that is not the case. Um, that women are willing and able to speak out if they have are abused, have violence against them. Yeah, it's it's difficult. I think the um, the Me Too movement is more nascent there, but people are women are beginning to speak out more. Um, if you know, if not about domestic violence, then certainly about social issues. They have the the Kutu movement, which is against being made to wear heels in the workplace and and uh, and also being banned from wearing glasses because it makes them appear cold. You know, so there are all kinds of new social initiatives now that are really coming to the fore. I think Mieko Kawakami says women are no longer content to shut up. Mm -hmm. It's funny about the wearing heels because we sort of raise our eyebrows, but actually a few years ago in London, there was a receptionist who the, at a law firm and they uh, uh, required her to wear heels and she mm. took them to court about it. So it's not just in Japan, um, it's mm. elsewhere too, but maybe now, you know, we're, we've come further in England because we can take people to court, whereas they might not be quite willing to yet in Japan, but still it's... Uh, Things die hard. It takes a long time for things to to uh, become to equalize. Yeah. Sorry, um, Nikita, go. Nikita. Yeah, no, what I was going to say was not necessarily about violence, but more in line with what Tracy is saying about um, expectations. Um, I recently read Invisible Women by Caroline Criado mm -hmm. Harris, which is all about data bias in the world yeah. and how it's all the, the entire world, as we know, it has been created um, physically in practical terms for men, whether that's, you know, how cities have been constructed or, um, you know, how heart diagnoses take place or medical trials. Um, and it was sort of jaw dropping when I read it. And I was also astounded at myself for not knowing most of what was in it, but it's a very diligent excavation of how, how much, you know, emotional labor a woman is carrying in the workplace and how little is done in order to sort of, um, adapt to women's lives but also as I say in the medical on the, on the medical front or on buses or in shops or in the home um, how little has been done to create things for women and this not she says at one point this is not out of malice this is this is because women are invisible and haven't mm. been thought of mm. when the construction of those environments is taking place um, and the thing she was asked, what was what's most infuriating for you of all of the things that you discovered when you were researching the book? And she said it, it's that crash test dummies are always men for when a car crashes. Mm. Um, and when the EU decided to use to not do that, they used a smaller version of a male crash test dummy to test the car <laughs> rather than a female one. Um, so that's sort of at the other end of the scale from out and out violence as, as is in Stephanie's book, um, mm -hmm. where there's a sort of misogyny, you know, an overtly mis act of, an overt act of misogyny. Um, I guess I'm, that, that subtle gradation of misogyny that infiltrates everything, that's mm -hmm. fascinating to me in that book. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is that Karen? Sorry, I dropped out there for a second. But is that that's Caroline Criado Perez's book, which that's yes, right. yeah. yes, yeah, which is absolutely what's well, a good read. It's very shocking, though. I think, isn't it? But, yeah. Um, I just wanted to actually to 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 ask you actually as women writers because I think we, we've de definitely moved on a long way from when the Brontes had to um, have male pseudonyms in order to be taken seriously. But I just wondered what your experience had been as, as women writers or whether you felt that you'd been treated slightly differently or as, as women writers. Um, Tracy, is that something that you could comment on? <laughs> it's really hard. It's very, it's very subtle. Um, and I, I think, you know, on the surface of it, I feel that I've been treated equally. Uh, but 
in in reality, I I know the numbers. I mean, I know they're getting better, but there is a there are um, surveys taken of um, every year of of how many. I can't remember what the name of this survey is, but it's they 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 count up how many women have been reviewed and how many. Yeah men have been reviewed, uh, male authors, female authors, and also the reviewers, whether they're male or female. And it was really shocking. And, and I, you know, I, I published first in 1997 and things have improved a lot because there was a huge outcry in this probably five or six years ago. And um, I think that to their credit, literary editors on newspapers have really tried hard to, uh, to, to make it a little bit more equal, but I guess I, I dropped in the middle of that in 97 when it was not very um, equal at all. And I, you know, I have no idea if, if a different writer, if a male writer had written the books that I read, wrote, would I be further along in my career or, or, or would they, would they have been taken more seriously? I, and there's this whole question of whether, um, because you know we we know this classic thing of uh, that that women will read books with male protagonists in them, but mm-hmm. men tend not to, mm-hmm. and um, and I I just don't know if we are more open minded and men are less open minded. I hate to make that kind of sweeping generalization, but um, I've personally pushed against that by only reading women. <laughs> I only read, for the longest time, I realized I was just reaching for books by women. And, and now I've had to kind of switch that a little bit to, to be a little bit more open-minded myself. But, uh, but, as a, but as a writer, I think I've been pretty lucky and I haven't come up against um, being treated, you know, paid less or treated less fairly. Um, I think that men are probably still taken more seriously for the most part, um, male writers, uh, but that's changing. I think there was a whole generation of the Ian McEwens and Julian Barnes and Salman Rushdie and Martin Amis. Everybody talks about them and, uh, and less about uh, the women from that time, uh, Rose Tremaine and Hilary Mantel. But, but the thing is, it is shifting now. So there are definitely more, more and more women. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think of novelists, uh, more women read novels, more women buy novels. So you would think there would actually probably be more uh, novels published by women and they would do well. But um, and I think that is slightly shifting, but it would be good. I should shut up now and hear from the younger generation because mm-hmm. you have a much cl- closer experience to this than I do. Nikita, what about you? Well, well yeah, it's, 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 it's so interesting um, hearing what, what you're saying about the last 20 years. Um, I think that I always become a, a, some sort of... Um, internalized misogyny comes to the fore and I always become obsessed with the idea of a male reader because I think when when I'm about to be published with each book the uh, the first um cover that comes through strangely even though it isn't really linked to anything in the book is often purple or pink and has some sort of paisley um pattern in my case all over the and um and this book for example it's got a great cover now i think but it, it's it's much grittier it's very right. um light and shade in dark spaces of london it's nothing to do with looking like a pink cookery book from the south Asia, you know subcontinent yeah. but um but that's the first pass always with each book and i find it bizarre and i think is that is that that they've eliminated They've eliminated in their head a certain kind of male reader, or is that what the publishing industry thinks? Do you that say anything to your publisher? Do, do you yeah. say, so in each case say like, pink. let's avoid the no, pink? And, and I, love, I actually do love the dialogue I have and the editor I have and the, and the pu- pu- publicist and the pub- publicity team, because then it changes. So I have been able to talk this through. Um, it hasn't just been a dark, smoldering bitterness in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I talk it through, but I remember early on, someone said to me, um, you know, what the, the ideal cover on a piece of literary fiction written by a woman is a woman in silhouette turning away. You can't see her face. And she's a woman in silhouette turning away from the cover, on the cover. Yeah. Um, 
And or she has her head cut off. Or she, she had the head cut off, yeah. right? Yeah. She, <laughs> but you can't, you mustn't see her face yeah. because the female reader, and there is only a female reader for that book, um, is going to um, is going to put their own face into that silhouette <laughs> or in, into that sliced off head. Right. They will put their own head. And it suggests that, A, it's quite bizarre and in, in, in gender lines and heteronormative, et cetera, but it's also this idea that, you know, we eliminate men from reading female books. And I found that idea quite difficult, mm -hmm. I would say, that you'd eliminate them as a possible reader for your books. Yeah. Um, Whereas with this book, with this book, I've seen, um, for example, on Goodreads, which I always find very interesting, I see that that it's split the readers of you people, it's split mm -hmm. between male and female, or you know, with the where the pronouns are male and female, um, and so that's interesting to me. But that I that's the that's the part I found difficult of being a female writer, not differences in pay and that kind of thing. Yeah, it's more that idea that you may not. There's a whole sector who may not read you and that that is assumed mm. yeah i wonder if this if this feeds into that a little bit but there is a phenomenon that um that i and my sort of fellow fellow debuts we've all bonded together over the pandemic um so we're in touch quite a lot but there's a phenomenon that that obsesses all of us um which is you know are female writers expected to uh relate their novels to themselves personally. And I guess also in terms of publicity, mm. the kind of features that we are asked to write often um, to promote the book, they're so extremely true. personal. There's always almost yeah. a sense that with women, you're expected to bleed onto the page. Um, mm. I do wonder yeah. if, if men are asked to do quite as much of that. Mm. Um, yeah. I suspect yeah. not, <laughs> I suspect not. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. I, yeah. I feel like I'm going to I'm going to look at the interviews and the, the pieces that men write now and and with that with that in mind to see if that's the case. But I think you're absolutely right. A woman is meant to be more giving of herself. Certainly. I mean, when um, my novel is about mothers and daughters and, and when I was writing it, you know, my mom became very seriously ill. I thought I might, we thought we might lose her and thankfully we didn't. Um, and she's fine, touch wood now. But, uh, but that was, that was a particular interest. I think in the features I were asked, they were like, oh, could you talk about how that um, related to the novel, you know, as opposed to yeah. the novel being a piece of fiction that I'd crafted. Of course it had an impact, but I, I was very much expected to, delve deep into the emotional odyssey um yeah I, I would like to know about my male contemporaries and if they're expected to bleed quite so much and did you say instead no to your publicist actually no i want to write articles about um the misogynist culture in in uh, japan thank you very much yeah you should write about that stephanie that's that's fascinating what you were talking about with the heels and then yeah but it is, it's what absolutely interests me. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's what I researched, it's what I worked on. Um, um, I think... Uh-oh. You know, I won, I won anthropological grants for my uh, work uh, in Japan. And so, uh, you know, I would, I would love to talk about my research <laughs> as opposed to my personal background and feelings. Yeah. You always get asked what, whether whether it's autobiographical. I think <laughs> that, that happens to me a lot in with each book, but I assume that that happens to men as well. I mean, or do, do you think that that happens mainly to women? Um, the assumption that it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent autobiographical that Tracy's gone back in time and lived in that, era yeah, and yeah. come back to write the book. <laughs> I think I think that's I think that is something that. Um, the people inflict upon women authors actually mm. uh, the assumption that it is autobiographical um, and it's difficult because there's so much of oneself in every novel that we write in you know my yeah. my Indian grandmother is a is a lawyer it's no coincidence at all that Samika's grandfather Yoshi is a lawyer and that I've chosen to tell the story through the prism of law um, you know I think my family always hoped I would be a lawyer but that doesn't mean that 
this is the story of my life. But, but I, to I, be fair, that's probably the case of men as well. There's a lot of autobiographical elements because that's what, you know, writing, all writing is going to reveal the interests of the writer, um, whether they write specifically about themselves or not. That's true. Yeah. I think we're, where's Yvette? I think, yeah, Yvette, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> Good. Good. Can, can you hear me at all? We can hear no, we you. Can hear. Yes, no, we can hear you. I think there's a delay. If I... Can you hear us? Oh, I think she's. Yes. I'm wondering if we were going to go on to questions from the audience, if there are any, but we don't have any access to that, us three. Yvette has the access to it. So we're hoping that Yvette's going to come on. If not, maybe Ken who's in the background, everybody, there are people in the background here who are doing stuff. So they might be able to feed those questions to us. Oh, no, Yvette's here. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just keep dropping out and coming back in again. And um, so I'm, I'm really sorry about that. I don't, don't know what's happening here. I, I just thought perhaps we could, um, as, a, as a kind of wrapping up um, and trying to be a bit positive about um, about everything it's just could you just tell me what where where you what makes you feel optimistic about the future for for women's rights and how can we finish this unfinished business do you think wow um i'll i think i am really heartened by um by movements like me too by um the invisible woman the book uh, I just feel like that book would not have been published uh, even 10 years ago. And, and the fact that it is, and that people are talking about it, and I get it, it's referenced so often. And I think, wow, people are really opening, opening their eyes. And I, I, that makes me really hopeful about the future. Great. Yeah, my, um, I guess my book's about altruism on one level and whether altruism exists. And during the pandemic, I've seen that... Um, you know, all of these grassroots movements have sprung up within the community where people are helping each other. And that goes mm -hmm. for the women who are on their own, living on their own, or who are in um, difficult domestic situations, you know, just in the roads, that, the road that I live in. Um, I got someone knocking on the door say, saying they were collecting for someone who is like many was in a tricky domestic violence situation during lockdown in order to get her out and get her set up in a council flat near mm -hmm. us. And that kind of thing that happened a lot in the pandemic, you know, looking after elders who are on their own. Um, and that, that, made, that made me feel optimistic in terms of the fact that I was interested in altruism for the book. Right, and Stephanie? Um, yes, I think there is a great deal of, of hope. Uh, I love the the energy of, of women, the focus. And, you know, I think you can see it even, you can see it particularly in the literary world in Japan where, you know, it has traditionally been extremely male focused. Mm -hmm. There are now some fantastic voices um, who are coming to mm -hmm. the fore and, uh, and really um, occupying their rightful place, I think, in center stage. And so that is, that is extremely heartening to, to hear and, and, and to see. And, uh, and there is, you know, things are changing. Every the society's society around the world is evolving, and so that is always an encouraging thing. Well, thank you. Uh, just before we go, then, um, uh, just a quick reminder that there are more free um, unfinished business leads events taking place over this weekend. So you can find details of those on the British Library website. Um, but otherwise, I'd just like to say thank you so much to the authors. Tracy, Nikita and Stephanie, um, to the British Library and Leeds Libraries, to Unique Media for hosting the event, and to all of you out there who've been attending. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Um, and just another quick reminder that you can use the menu above to give us uh, any feedback. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, sorry I was a bit glitchy. Um, it was lovely to speak to you all. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.